everybody. Yeah, so I came down to that uh, Scythe competition, and one of the judges was, was uh, you know, is it, do I have to say Professor Powell? You can then? say Greg. Greg, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, kind of really was impressed with the, with the panel, the people that were on it. They were really interactive. And I got to tell you, I've, I've spoken on stage with the Dalai Lama, with Richard Branson, with Stephen Covey, with F.W. de Klerk. I mean, I could, I could kind of list the names, but I've never been more nervous in my life than when I presented at 16 years old to that Scythe group. I remember I, I kept going to the bathroom and my hands were sweaty and all this kind of stuff, but you know, took third place, won the 500 bucks. It gave me a little bit of an affinity towards SUU. But then I came down here for something called Governor's Honors Academy, which was a 10 day type of thing that you come down, you meet senators, you meet the president of companies, you kind of do a bunch of different activities with, with 50 other of the top students in the state. Although I wasn't a top student, I was an alternative. I, you know, I, got, uh, there, I was like number 50 something. And so originally I didn't get in, so all I did was this woman, Sandra, who's in charge of it, uh, and this is, there's a lesson in this, I just started calling her and saying, hey, you know, this looks like an amazing program. I just want to let you know, I'll do whatever it takes to get there. So if someone can't make it, please, what would it take for me to be on the top of the list? Can I get the checklist of things they need to prepare for before they get down there? Because I'll just start doing those things right now. That way, if someone can't make it, you can just have me come in without any hitch and no, no problem. And so I ended up, by the time I got there, I knew Sandra better than any of the other attendees and had a little bit of favor. And that really is, been a lot of what my career is about. When I started in financial services, uh, I made kind of mistakes in the first two years. So the first two years, I was 19 and 20, because it was 1998, I was still a student here, and I was going out there, and if, if you are familiar with the stock market during those times, the 90s was kind of the best time that the stock market's ever had. So I went to all my family and friends, and I got them to cash out of really safe investments, and I put them into really speculative type of mutual funds, and I seemed like a genius. I was kind of like the Doogie Howser, if you even know what Doogie Howser was. It was like this, you know, it was uh, Neil Patrick Harris's first role, where he was like this genius boy doctor, you know. I was like that for finance, supposedly, because all the money I was, you know, taking of theirs and putting it into these investments was going up. But all ships were rising when the tide was going up, and Warren Buffett says you find out who's swimming naked when the tide rolls back. And most financial people were swimming naked because in the year 2000, the tide rolled back, and now I was no longer a boy genius. I was like, hey, what, what the heck is going on with our investments? What should we do? And most of the financial firms are telling me, oh, tell them they're in it for the long haul, or that the market's on sale, or they're kind of giving me a lot of things that I should regurgitate. But at the same time, fortunately, I had a mentor here because I was still, you know, a uh, senior at the time, Stephen Harrop. So Don, is, is Stephen Harrop still a professor here? He's not, he's retired. Not. Okay, he's retired, but I was a, a senator for the business college and he was, uh, I was one of the first students to greet him when he came in. And once again, part of where I created opportunity was when I knew what he did, which was manage $5 billion in municipal bonds. So $5 billion. He was ranked number one by 17 different categories, uh, whether that was Smart Money, Money Magazine, Lipper, you name it, anything in finance. He was the guy. So when I found out he was going to be a professor and done a little bit of research on him, I made sure to, to befriend him. And so I really recommend, like, especially at SUU, there's so many great people here that you can actually build a relationship with instead of get completely lost and I still keep in touch with him. Uh, you know, he's, he's given me a lot of great advice. He actually became a client of mine as time went on. But when I built that relationship and the market started going down, fortunately we sat down, and I don't know if it's still there, it was like Hoagie Yogi in the Sharwan Smith Center, and we had a little yogurt, and he basically helped me walk through getting everyone out of the stock market by May of 2000, which meant we had two and a half years of additional slide that they didn't have to experience because I was willing to sit down and be honest with him and have a conversation and he helped guide me through that. So we saved hundreds of thousands of dollars for people, it would have been millions, but I was like a teenager basically managing money. So it wasn't like, you know, in Price, Utah, I wasn't really like having massive portfolios, but it taught me a huge lesson. And the biggest lesson is that where the wealth exists for people, is in the relationships they have, but the only way to build those relationships is bring something really unique to the equation. So if you could really figure out what, you know, what is it that you do? Like, what is it that you could contribute? I think everyone has their own unique combination of what they can contribute, which is take, take your abilities, and there's four levels to abilities. The first level is incompetence. 
And there's plenty of people that do really incompetent things because they were told it was a good job, because they were told that it was going to pay off in the future. But if you're not really good at it and you're incompetent, it means that you're going to delay it, procrastinate it, and not be that good at it, so you're never going to get far ahead. The second thing that people spend a lot of time in is things they're competent at. Things we're competent at, yes, we can accomplish them, but they usually drain our energy. We don't love doing them, but we do it in the name, a lot of times, of saving money or as a bridge to find that career that we want sometime in the future. An example of this is we met a guy by the name of Del Clark back in 2005, although I had heard about him in 2003 because his parents were my clients, Jeff and Mary. And Jeff and Mary were always trying to get Dell to come and learn from us, but he was like, no, I don't need to learn from anyone, I'm doing fine. He was a rocket scientist, so designing airplane engines, reluctantly, because his dad told him that was a good job. And he does have some proclivity that he's pretty good with, you know, designing that stuff, but he kind of hated it. When it came down to it every day, he begrudgingly went to do it in the name of trading that for a paycheck. And fortunately, Dell was a little bit heavy set when we first met him. We had an event where his dad bought a ticket and we had food that was included, so he came for the free food and free ticket that lured him in. And that changed his life because when he came, he said at the end of the day, hey, in one year, I'm going to get in a financial situation where I have enough income coming in to cover my expenses and now I can really choose which career I'm going to pursue. And I was kind of like, that's really ambitious, little boy. I mean, that would be really cool, but that's really probably not going to happen in one year. But the dude lived off of like food storage, worked an extra 20 hours a week, and found a way to create enough investment income to replace his income, having less than $100,000 in net worth. So he's kind of like this standard. And then he came to me after he did that, and he goes, you know what, I really want to come work for your organization. I'm like, well, that's cool, but we're not hiring. Um, and he said, well, actually, I figured out you guys are missing some pieces on cash flow optimization. I've sketched this out. Here's a diagram, and here's the things we can do. I'm like, you know what, you've got a place here. Absolutely, let's do this. And so what he did was he became entrepreneurial within our organization. His income, by the way, is up 760% from the time that he joined us, partially because he wasn't a slave to the dollar anymore. But what he also did was give up things he was really excellent at. That's the third level. Excellence is a trap. I know this may sound strange, but when you're really excellent at something, but you're not completely unique at it, what makes an entrepreneur great is when they find their most insider advantage. See, when you use an insider advantage in the stock market, you go to jail. When you use insider advantages in entrepreneurship, you make a boatload of money. That's the difference. So uh, the way to, to kind of look at this is, Anyone ever read the monstrosity called Money Master of the Game? It's 750 pages by Tony Robbins. I mean, it's a freaking massive book. You're in school, so you're probably not going to read it because you've got a lot of other textbooks to read. But in the book, it's pretty fascinating because he interviews 15 billionaires in the book. 14 of the billionaires completely lie on how it takes, to, you know, what the formula is to having a lot of wealth. I'll just kind of release what it is. 91% of people in our population worth $5 million or more have one thing in common. They own a business. So almost everything about personal finance out there tells people if you just save, sacrifice, delay, and defer, and if you just are a, a miser and you just scrimp, that one day, someday, you could die a broke millionaire. Meaning, yes, you can be a millionaire by never ever spending a dollar and just saving, I don't know if you've met those miserable millionaires, the ones that you would never know as a millionaire, you know, it's like they're still, they don't turn on their, their air conditioning in the summer, you know, when they drive their car out onto the road, a hubcap comes across and may, puts everybody in danger because it's such a jalopy, and look, I get, when you don't have money, that's one thing, but when you have millions of dollars, but no one knows it, because you haven't even told your kids that, what ends up happening is within three years of their death, that money's gone because someone just inherited that money and didn't realize what did it take to make it. So, back to Tony Robbins' book. When he interviews these billionaires, he goes to Charles Schwab, and I'm sure you've all heard of Charles Schwab, and he says, what, would it, you know, what do you recommend for people to become wealthy? And he goes, oh, I think they should invest in discount brokerage accounts. What you've got to realize is, you're not going to become wealthy investing in discount brokerage accounts. He became a billionaire because he invented discount brokerage accounts. He became that billionaire because he owned a business and he offered something that didn't exist before. Or I'm sure you've all heard of Vanguard, right? So the person who started Vanguard, when, they inter when Tony interviewed him, he says, oh, you should invest in index mutual funds. No, he didn't make his money investing in index mutual funds. He made his money creating index mutual funds. So finally, one of the guys, his name's Mark Farber, he's referred to as the boom, doom, and gloom guy. He said, 
you know, when Tony asked him, hey, if there's only one thing you could pass on to the next generation, and if it wasn't money, what would you tell him? He says, I would tell them their best chance in this world is to find out their insider advantage and bring that out to the marketplace through a business. That's how wealth is created. So I grew up in a family that was not entrepreneurial. I grew up in a family that actually saw that as pretty risky. And I'll also tell you that there were some professors at SUU that really tried to encourage me to go down a path that was going to be pretty, pretty good for the school, but not necessarily good for me. But it was Dean Templin that encouraged me to do something that was the hardest choice in my life and made forever a difference. So I'll talk about that for a minute. When I was, so the only person that was even a little bit entrepreneurial in my family, because I come from Price, as Greg mentioned, which means my dad was a coal miner, both my grandfathers were coal miners, and all my great-grandfathers were coal miners. Now my mom is one of those like Italian women that was like, oh hell, you're not even going to step your foot into a coal mine. There's no chance. She saw what kind of life that was, and you know, you know, you got to worry about everything from black lung to something exploding to, you know, just wearing your body down to you name it. She knew that that was a complete trap, and in price what they try to do is when you're in high school, give you a job that pays more than any other job working for the coal mine, because that's just like a little hit of a uh, drug, right? So you're like, okay, yeah, I want, I want more of that money. Because my dad was in college, going to Weber State, playing basketball, but when his dad lost his job due to an injury or something that happened, he came back and became a coal miner because that coal miners in the 70s made more than college graduates. The problem is coal mining went like this and the rest of the world went like this, right? Because they started creating technology and innovation and they needed less reliance upon the human labor and, and you know, so it, it, bas it basically became efficient. So back to this concept of an excellence trap, Things you're excellent at, you could do better than maybe anyone you know, and this is gonna become even more apparent when you get to be a business owner, but there are things that other people can do if you're really good at recruiting talent. See, most businesses, the big mistakes they make is that an individual starts a business and they try to do too much on their own. And by doing too much on their own, they hit capacity where they can't really reach the marketplace fully, they get exhausted. Yes, you can go, create a million dollar business on sheer willpower, but at the same time, you're gonna wear yourself down and probably start hating that. And all this freedom that the entrepreneur was supposed to have, they found out they didn't have freedom because every time they go on vacation, they think about the money they're losing in their business. Every time they try to go to a sporting event, they think about their business 24 seven if they're the ones that are wrapped up in doing too much of it. And that's how it started for me. In my 20s, people would say, oh, you live in Utah, do you ski? I'm like, I don't ski, I own a business. The business actually owned me, but I thought I owned a business. It was like just creating a job, essentially, you know, that I, that I could never let go of because any time I did, I knew that money wasn't coming in. That is where you hit the excellence trap. Yes, I was really excellent doing some of the things that I did. In the name of saving money, I even did things I was competent or incompetent at. And it's really easy to know what you're competent or incompetent in. It's the things that you always say that you need to get done, but they never seem to get done. And they always kind of start dragging on you to the point where you start working on the weekends. Like, have you ever met someone that owns a business that they're just constantly working and that's all that they do? So in an entrepreneurship course, I want to say that early on, if you could start to identify some of these traps and start creating proper parameters, you can start building a life that you actually love instead of getting burned out. So that's why I'm sharing some of this. So to move past excellent is the fourth thing. And that's unique. All of you have something that you're unique in. And the way that you scale business, when I say scale, does that make sense? Like leverage is maybe another word, right? The way that you do that is that you find the thing that you're most unique in and you build a framework or a structure or a team around that to be able to do what no one else could do because I actually think the most valuable thing in business is vision. Vision is the rarest of commodities that we see in the world, right? Vision is tough because when you're thinking about and you're creating a vision, you're not being paid directly for doing that in that moment. But let's think, like last night were the debates, you know? Trump's companies probably made money last night, I mean, all that kind of stuff while he's doing that. Because when he talks about building the most huge and gorgeous and best buildings in the world, he never lifts a hammer, right? All he's doing is selling a vision. And, and by the way, 
part of having a vision, you are going to meet business owners. You're like, that is really someone that's worth that much money. They're going to seem like idiots to you because sometimes it takes a little bit of being um, ignorant to have a big enough vision to think that you could accomplish it, right? It's like really intelligent people can think of all the reasons it's not going to work. It takes just, like when, I, when I'm 22 years old and I walk into what's called the family office in New York City, and I see that when people are worth $50 million or more, they get a different team, they get different advice, and I go, well, you got to be worth $50 million to get this. I'm going to bring this to the other entrepreneurs that don't have access to this. That was a naive statement. That took me 10 years. Or when I say I'm going to write a book and become a New York Times bestseller, I had no idea what that meant or how to do that. But you know, you got to have it like the equal amount of ambition and ignorance, maybe a touch of arrogance to really make it in the business world. Because if you go talk to logical people, they're going to tell you all the reasons something won't work out, can't work out. But think of every amazing invention we've ever had came from some crazy entrepreneur that was willing to do something that was at one time completely impossible. Whether that was flight, whether that was the invention of certain technologies. I mean, it takes someone being entrepreneurial. And to me, entrepreneurism is just taking the existing resources and having better outcomes than what we have today. And okay, so back to when I was graduating here. First of all, I'm a good interviewer. So I got a lot of offers that I didn't deserve, candidly. Um, I went to Arthur Anderson in LA. And I remember it was the highest offer SUU had had for an accounting job, which in the interview, I didn't understand half the acronyms because I was lagging in my accounting courses more than any other thing that I was doing here at school, but I just knew what to say. So they offered me this job, I come back and tell some of my accounting professors, and of course they're accounting professors, so they're like, ooh, that's a great offer. Now when I look back, I think it was like $75,000, you know, 20 years ago in LA. So basically by the time you look at how many hours those people work, and what they're getting paid. I will tell you that I made $75,000 in a day in my first year out of school, so I was really glad that I didn't take that, but I was, my, my mom was compelling me to that. The other thing is Arthur Anderson. Who, do you know what Arthur Anderson is? Is that even a company you guys recognize? Remember Enron? They went under with Enron. They were one of the top five accounting firms in the world, and they're gone. The other offers I got, by the way, was Merrill Lynch. Merrill Lynch, they got annihilated not too long ago. Strong Investments, they were the number two investment company as far as performance in the world at the time I got an offer. They don't exist as a company anymore. And by the way, they were out of Milwaukee, so when I flew in, there was a blizzard. I didn't even see anything other than when I was inside of the buildings. And I returned to my girlfriend, who's now my wife at the time, I'm like, hey, would you be willing to move to Milwaukee? And I got one of those like, yeses that was like, I'll say that so you choose what you want to do, but there's no chance I'm actually moving there with you type of sentiments, right? But, but at the same time, I'm getting all this encouragement from my family who had always believed in, you just work hard, you get a job, and these companies take care of you. And that was more of a notion 20 years ago than it is today. But we've watched over and over where companies cannot pay the pensions that people are working for. And anytime someone puts a golden handcuff, is that a term you're familiar with, golden handcuff? When someone puts a golden handcuff on you, it's time to look at something different because you never want to do something just in the name of future promise benefits. Look, I think it's critical to understand how you benefit now. And if you're not clear about that and you're doing it in the hopes of something in the future, it's too dynamic of an economy to rest your entire future on an outcome that is almost impossible to accomplish because most pensions were based upon 8% returns in the stock market, which that is not going to happen in the future and hasn't happened. Part of the reason we've had certain states deal with bankruptcies and cities like Detroit and everything is because it didn't perform. What I love about entrepreneurship is you can get paid not based upon what's happening in the world economy, but what you're doing in your own personal economy. Because the world economy is always going to have really bad news. You can turn it on, you can hear about it, and a lot of that are factors that we absolutely can't control. But what I find about entrepreneurs is when they hear bad news, rather than being decimated and going, oh man, this is, you know, it's a recession, times are tough, they go, someone else's bad news means that there needs to be a solution to solve the bad news. Most of the greatest inventions came out of a deficiency, a detriment, a struggle, an issue. So rather than looking at it as all the reasons why you can't succeed, look at it as a reason of why you can. And look, I think it's a fascinating time in the world right now because never has it been easier to find what you're unique in and make money doing it. 
In the old days, when you wanted to start a business, like when FedEx was started, they had to raise a bunch of capital. They had to, and they would go and tell people, we're going to be able to ship, you know, ship things overnight. And, and people laughed at them and told them it was impossible. And so now they had to go convince all these investors to invest money. There's a whole bunch of risk with that. And then, yeah, that one actually worked out. But most of those companies don't necessarily work out. I mean, for every company we see on the front of you know, Entrepreneur Magazine, which I write for every three weeks, or Forbes, which I write for about five times a month, you know, I, I read these stories. The problem is they're showing you such a small sampling of what's real that everybody starts thinking if they do something, that's what's going to be the outcome. And a lot of those companies where people you know, are supposed to be great investors because they invested in Uber or Twitter early on. They're not talking about the thousand people that lost everything investing in other people's dreams before investing in their own. So my first rule is you invest first and foremost in yourself. Before you go invest in other companies that you've never been in their boardrooms, that you've never, ever, ever even seen their financials, and with investment managers that you've never met and you have no idea what their philosophies are, you've never talked to their analysts, this is what mainstream America calls investing. I call that gambling. It's gambling. And they're just putting all of their hopes and dreams on something they have no control over the outcome. Now in entrepreneurship, one thing that's certain is you will have failure along the way. That's just part of it. You'll make really bad mistakes and those are going to be really expensive lessons, but the best part is you can learn from those lessons and move forward. When you, like, I've invested in oil and gas in the past when it didn't make money, and I lost my money, it was a forced correction, I just had to move on. There wasn't a whole lot that I could learn because I don't know a lot about rock formations and depth and flow and like all this crazy stuff. But what I do know is when I invest in my own business and it doesn't work out exactly, I can make an adjustment and course correct moving forward. I don't have forced corrections, I have course corrections. So I'd rather invest in things that I know and this is a little bit counter to what you might hear in the world of investing, but the wealthiest people didn't diversify. They focused. Andrew Carnegie said, I put all my eggs in one basket and watch it like a hawk. Diversification is a tool when you're in ignorance. You don't know what's going to happen, you spread yourself thin. Businesses that die are businesses that prematurely diversify. When they start taking money outside of their realm of expertise, outside of what they know, outside of what they can control, in the hopes of some high return that they could never explain why it would work out, it's hard enough for a business owner to know what's happening in their own boardroom, let alone 500 other companies or other startups. So why I think today is a fascinating world is because it doesn't require major capital to start a company. Technology has leveled the playing field where it doesn't really matter whether you're male or female, whether you're black or white or Asian or whatever. It's just simply, can you provide value? More so than ever before. Because it's not about brute strength like it used to be. Right? It's not necessarily just about being royalty, although in other countries it's more like that. But more and more often, it's becoming more about value creation, which surprisingly and interestingly, has actually created more rich versus poor. We have a greater wealth gap, where you have more people that are even wealthier than ever before, and you have a lot of people that are more poor because it's not just about who you know, it's about what you know. You're now in a time where you better know something that you could bring to the world that no one else could bring to the world, and if you're willing to embrace that, you can have an amount of wealth that's unprecedented. But this whole notion of, Oh, if someone's wealthy, they've done something wrong or bad, is simply a notion of scarcity. It's simply a notion of people that actually believe that if someone's wealthy, they've taken something from someone else. But let's think about it. Has there ever been a time in human history with more wealth than there is today? If you wanted to listen to music 200 years ago, what did you have to do to listen to music? A, own an instrument and play it yourself, or B, hire a quartet to show up which most people didn't have that kind of money. They were just trying to get fed. If we look at you know, 300 years ago or 250 years ago, the number one focus of the United States was getting enough caloric intake. And you know what? One of the unprecedented parts of wealth in the US is when people had enough calories to survive every day so that all of their attention wasn't just on getting food, it could go towards other innov innovations and inventions. So when you think about it, you know how easy it is to be fed in the U.S. right now? I mean, you could basically sit at home, play Xbox, 
and do drugs and still have a jalopy car and air conditioning in the US right now simply because of the way the government structured in the old days if you did that you starved right you you had heat it was it was horrible so what happened was everyone's ideas up until this point have benefited you to a certain degree so it's not that if someone becomes wealthy there's less for someone else it actually means that there's potentially more as long as it wasn't done through deception or coercion that instead it was done through exchange and value creation so even if there was a finite amount of money in the economy which there there isn't really because they keep printing money it's all about how many times can dollars circulate in the economy the more times it circulates you know what makes money circulate serving others solving problems and creating value so if you want that circulation to stop at your door for a moment and be a flow in your life get crystal clear about the value you bring to the world and the more valuable what you bring to the world is the more you can get paid and there's really two ways to consider value number one how can I reach more people or number two how can I reach the people more deeply that's it's actually that's it's that simple and yet that complicated right it's simple to go yeah I just have to reach more people now how do you reach more people unprecedented today on how to reach people I mean we're having people buy our programs in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and I'm going like how insane is that like my kids just play with people in all these other countries like it's a normal thing right because of technology when I was a kid that would have been intimidating and, and just unfathomable but now we have all these efficient means of exchange I mean the largest company when it comes to you know hotels or overnight stays doesn't even own a hotel the largest transportation companies don't own cars so think about what that means we are in a time that is so beautiful for those entrepreneurs that are willing to embrace it and so scary for those that don't because in the old days you could just kind of be a bully and be like yeah we're not a really good company but we're so big we'll just buy everyone out and force everyone else out but today you know what if you're really hard to deal with disruptive technology is taking over disruptive technology I don't like when I'm in New York and I have to wait for a cab and it's shift change over and I get in there and it's a dirty cab and they're driving very scary but then I can use the lift and if it's not clean I can have feedback and I can see exactly where the cars at and I could you know not have to pull out a wall like that's just a convenience and so how many organizations out there still exist based upon old antiquated rules that entrepreneurs have for the taking I look at the world of investing you know the world of investing is this place where it became hey if I take people out to, to golf and I spend time and make them feel really good it didn't really matter as much about performance and I could justify this fee that's costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars over their life to now they have robots they have you know basic robo advisors it's just basically technology that's beating the regular advisors out there at a fraction of the price that's a disruptive technology so here's one way to find a good business what are all the businesses that you hate dealing with because they don't respect you they don't appreciate they're not quick to, they're not quick to get something done that you find everyone complaining about because they are ripe for the taking because guess what 20 years ago what were you going to do about it today you can invent it in your underwear in a garage you know in a basement I mean it's like Instagram I mean look at this like this is insane what's happening and to me it's just a great time to be alive that way now when you talk to non entrepreneurs it's a scary time where they're like what are my jobs going to be well you know what it's good that you're getting some training because it's going to be pretty scary for people that their job is consisting on driving because you know they already have driverless cars that are happening on uber on the east coast right now that they're testing out there's driverless cars that haven't been in an accident for two million miles my Mercedes has self-correcting mechanisms which reminds me what an atrocious driver I am every step of the drive down here you know it's like oh yeah I, I'm fit. but like with a driverless car it's like cool I can get work done there's like think about all the technology and think of everywhere where you can improve lives there's a huge huge opportunity there huge opportunity and that's what entrepreneurship is to me is like just finding those things in a way that delivers value 
Don't just think of where you can skim money or just where you can make money simply because it's a short-term thing. Think about where you can make a lasting impact and change because that's where there's going to be a huge reward. Does this make sense? Now, it's not, I'm not saying it's easy because when we decided we wanted to do that in finance, like I, didn't, I don't love in finance commissions. I don't love fees that come out whether people make money or not. So when we said, okay, we're gonna invent a model that's tuition-based, backed by results, and people have to write us a check, it's a lot easier for someone to set up an account, they don't even know how much money's coming out for those advisors to make money. I remember meeting with this guy, he owned 33, uh, 33 physical therapy and chiropractic clinics, and I said, our fee's 20 grand, and he's like, that's really expensive. I said, well, you've shared enough of your financial information, I just wanna ask, last year on your 401k, how much money did you make? He goes, I didn't make money, I lost money. I said, great, your fees for that were $19,132. So I'm gonna guarantee you that I'll put $40,000 in your pocket this year, otherwise I'll give you 100% of your money back and all of our labor and all of the team that you acquire is yours for free. And by the way, we freed up $39,000 a month for this business owner through a process called cash flow optimization. So it was harder to sell him on it until he experienced it. And that's part of the, the struggle is, you know, before soda existed, you had to tell people what soda was. Like, here's what soda, and they had, you had to educate them on it. So you're gonna invent things where you have to actually educate the marketplace on what it is because it didn't even exist before. But it's funny how now people use like, oh, we're the Uber for, right? So they use some existing technology and they use that to explain their technology. So that's, you know, just some, just some ramblings and thoughts about entrepreneurism. Now. In my area of expertise, I'm just gonna share some things that I think is important and critical as you start out. There's a whole mindset of budgeting that a lot of people have. And when I graduated college, I had a budgeting mindset, which is amazing that I'm still married through those first couple of years because if my wife ordered like a beverage with dinner, I'd be like, you know, if we compound that interest for the next 30 years, that's really a thousand dollar expense to our net worth. <laughs> and she's like, if you bring that up again, it's gonna be really expensive because I'm not gonna be around and I get half. <laughs> that's, that's really expensive. So anyway, she didn't, she didn't say that in so many words, but I could read between the lines. So, so look, no one shrinks their way to wealth. You don't shrink your way to wealth. So I know that you're gonna be given counsel to live within your means because that's good counsel. But when you hear live within your means, what do you think about doing? Well, you're cheating. That's not what most people think of. That's, that's the answer. You increase your means. Expand your means. Yeah, most people think not spending, but that's the real thing, is continually think about expanding your means. Live within it, but not through shrinking and constriction, through production, through value. That's a game changer. Now, I'm writing a book right now called Budgeting Sucks, and, and uh, just one of the main premise points of it is Look, right now, if you could start this habit today, it will change your life forever because the, the disease or plague for most business owners is that they're pretty good at making money. They're pretty horrific at actually keeping their money, right? Because they, they have a disease a lot of times called, I call it spending optimism. Like as an entrepreneur, you can have an amazing month and be like, this is how it's always gonna be. So you extrapolate that out and now buy things based upon that amazing month, not realizing well, like we have entrepreneurs that make a ton of money selling stuff on Amazon, but Amazon could change something, including the, the logarithmic fashion of how they determine how your product ranks, and overnight, your product ranking could change, right? Or you could be sourcing your product from China, and it's the Chinese New Year, and so they're taking weeks off, and so all of a sudden you don't have product to ship. I mean, in business, there's so many things that can happen, so I want you to be able to defeat something called Parkinson's Law. Parkinson's Law says that as you have an increase in income, your expenses will rise to meet or exceed that increase within three to six months, unless you have an infrastructure. So let me simplify the infrastructure, and if you start this today, this is something to go put on the ground in the next 24 hours. Wherever you bank, go set up a separate checking, savings, or money market account than your personal account. And any time money comes into you, whether that's through student loan or through a job that you have or a business that you've already created, 
You want to take and pay yourself first. This was written in the 1920s by a guy named George S. Clausen in a book called Richest Man in Babylon. Still true today. If you pay yourself first, rather than having to develop a really strict budget that might take a lot of energy, instead, if you just automatically start saving money off the top as a percentage, as your income goes up, that percentage is always going to remain the same. So at the banks that we work with, we just have them say, we want to have a percentage relationship and we want it to be a sweep account. Meaning every time I get a paycheck, let's say it's $1,000, I put it in my personal account, $180 is going to go into my wealth capture account, my separate account, and the remainder goes into my personal account. And rather than budget, what I've done is once a month, I sit down with my wife on the personal side, I sit down with my controller on the business side, I say, did we stay within our parameters? We didn't borrow and go outside of what we earned, did we? If the answer is no, I'm okay because I paid myself first. Then, rather than automatically investing, a lot of people automate their investing, that's a horrible idea. Automate your savings. Automate your savings and deliberately allocate money towards your investments. And only invest in things that you're really understanding and that you've managed and mitigated your risk. So let me give an example of managing risk and not managing risk and how to think about investing really quick. Let's use banks as an example. So I remember in 2007 meeting with this couple in South Jordan and they had a $1.5 million home, which is a pretty nice home in South Jordan, one of the nicer ones. And the woman had financed it and I said, well, what do you do? She goes, well, I, I stay at home with the kids. I'm like, so you're a domestic engineer and you financed a $1.5 million home. Tell me how this happened. She goes, oh, I did a stated income loan. I'm like, oh, we did a stated lie loan. Just state whatever income you need. To, and this is why, we got, why the banks got in trouble, is they go, hey, Greg, you need another $7,000 of income, then we can get you this loan. We're gonna move to a stated income loan. And the brokers just kind of had this going on with the underwriters, and so they weren't managing risk. But now they probably take it to the other extreme. But if you're gonna go get a mortgage, what's the first thing a bank wants to know about you? Income, so they're gonna look at your taxes, right? What's the second thing they're gonna look at? Credit score, right? All right, so they're looking at your income, they're looking at your credit score. What if you found the best deal on a home imaginable? It's actually probably 50% of equity right there from day one, but you have a horrible credit score and not a lot of income. Will the bank lend to you? No, they're not in the business of real estate. Real estate is only collateral. They're in the business of cash flow. They're just trying to create cash flow and they want to see what kind of borrower you are and they want to see what kind of risk you are so that's why they look at your credit that's why they look at your taxes the real estate is there to back you up in case something goes wrong and they're pretty bad at managing that real estate when they take it over so they don't want to have to take it over now if you don't have a lot of money for a down payment what does the bank do mortgage. yep they charge you private mortgage insurance so they charge you and by the way, when you go to buy the home, they make you pay for the appraisal. So they've looked at your credit score, they've made you pay for an appraisal, they want 20% down minimum, otherwise they're charging you more money. All they're doing is mitigating and managing their risk. And what they're focused on is cash flow. As a matter of fact, they're so focused on cash flow. So when I was in, in high school, I had this professor, uh, Mr. Moynier, and he showed me the difference between a 15-year and a 30-year mortgage. And I rushed home to make sure my mom was on a 15-year mortgage. And she was. And I was like, thank God you're saving so much interest. But then Professor Hamlin here, I'm taking an economics course, and I paid more attention in his course because of the Hamlinian curve. And, uh, you know, I, I, I want to make sure to pass the class. And he showed kind of this thing called opportunity cost. And then I rushed home and told my mom, why are you on a 15-year mortgage? You should be on a 30-year mortgage because of opportunity cost. Simply... Let me say this, without going into all the details of why that, what that means. Do you think a bank makes more or less money if you're on a 15-year mortgage than a 30-year mortgage? They make more. Here's why. If you, you know, a lot of people will get a mortgage and the bank turns around and sells that mortgage later on. They can sell it for more if there's a higher amount of cash flow coming in. The bank is, all they're caring about is how can they get your cash as quick as possible so they're incentivizing you. Bi-weekly payments, which is one full extra payment per year, or shortening your loan and charging less interest. When has a financial institution ever said, this is way better for you, so we're gonna actually get paid less? No, they don't give you breaks unless they're incentivizing certain behavior. So think about this from investing. They're in the business of cash flow, that's all they're focused on and they're managing risk. Yet most people, when they go invest, 
They're not thinking about those things. They're waiting for 30 years to pay off. So I'm going to give you two tools that you can use forevermore to help you be a better investor and help you manage creating better cash flow. The first one is called cash flow index. Your cash flow index is simply anytime you get a loan, student loan, car loan, mortgage, business loan, anything, you take the loan balance. So you take the loan balance and you divide it by the minimum required payment. That's called your cash flow index, okay? If that is less than 50, it's called a low cash flow index and it means you have a cash hog on your hands. It means the bank has given you pretty much a small amount of money, but they're requiring a relatively high payment in comparison to what you owe. So that's gonna harm your cash flow, which could also harm your debt to income, which is for every dollar you earn, what percentage has to go towards loans. That's gonna impact the rate you pay for business loans. It's gonna impact whether you get offered a business loan. So you wanna find out your cash flow index. If it's more than 100, I would call that an efficient loan. And I don't think in terms of what you might hear out there in the world, I was just on Robert Kiyosaki's podcast last week. He talks about good debt and bad debt. We don't have time or else I'd go into more of that. I'll, I'll give you guys, I'll, I'll give a, a PDF of my book and then they can kind of look at either the books for free, um, Killing Sacred Cows and What Would the Rockefellers Do? Because What Would the Rockefellers Do? In the very first chapter talks about Dean Templin and what he did for me in my career and encouraging me to do something no one else in my family could do. And it totally transformed my life. And my life is infinitely better because of it. So I have a pretty big affinity for this school for sure um, because it made a big difference. And you know, Professor Powell, from the time I'm a teenager, 16 years old, you know, laughing at my, at my poor jokes and still remembering them to this day and encouraging me after I gave a presentation I was really nervous for, I, I came here because I had personal attention. You know, look, I had a scholarship to the U, I had a scholarship to other places, but I've stayed in touch here because really relationship capital. And a lot of the opportunities came from the lessons I learned outside of the classroom on this campus. So cash flow index, less than 50, inefficient, more than 100, efficient, in between is kind of your danger zone that you have to manage. Now, when you go to invest, I want you to figure out your investment index, which is, you look at the amount of money that you've put into an investment. Not what the investment's worth, but how much did you put into that investment, right? Your deposits, and then you divide it by the monthly cash flow. So the money you put into the investment divided by the monthly cash flow. Now, on this side, you're like the bank. You want a really low number, because a low number means, I didn't put in a lot of money, but a lot of money's coming in on a monthly basis. Here, you want a high number because it means, I got a big amount of money, or I don't have much of a payment for the money that I got, right? This is all around managing cash flow. And there's so many adults that when we, when we analyze this for them, what we find is they've got really low cash flow indexes and really high investment index. So let me say this really simply and then I'll, then I'll drive it home. You can't even believe how many people I'll meet with. They've got a 3% certificate of deposit and a 7% loan. I'm like, why don't you cash out the certificate of deposit and pay off the loan? They're like, oh no, there's a penalty on that for cashing out early. I'm like, okay, let's say there really is a penalty. Let's call the bank and, and let's go through the motions here. What's the penalty? Oh, you forfeit three months interest. Three months interest is not much of a penalty in today's low interest rate environment, right? But if they cash it out and they pay off, let's just say that they're paying 3%, they're getting 3%, but they're paying 6%. Would you think 100% return is a pretty good rate of return? If you pay off a 6% interest rate with 3% money, that's 100% return because this is like, don't look at it as a 3% spread. Imagine if you could buy a hammer for three bucks and you sell it for six, what's the markup? 100%. That's 100% difference between those two. Yet most financial advisors would never tell someone to pay off that because they lose their commissions when that happens. So. What I want you to find out is how good of an investor are you versus how good are you at managing your cash flow with your loans? Because for some people, the very best thing they could do is pay off a loan. For others, the very best thing they could do is keep control of their money. It depends on who you are. Personal finance should be personal. Does this make sense? So you pay yourself first, and then you strategically determine whether you pay something off or whether you build something. Now, some people should just pay it off. Like Rich was here last week. Rich's wife said when he wanted to be a business owner, if you pay off the mortgage, we can, you can be a business owner. Rich has sold 11 businesses. That was a real high rate of return on paying off that mortgage. 
right? But most people, if you shorten your loan, pay extra to the bank, you're just locking your money away. And banks love lending money to people who don't need it. They never lend to people who are in desperate need of it. So be careful what you lock away at a bank and make sure you keep control of your cash and manage your cash flow as a business owner because the difference between success and bankruptcy when it comes to businesses are those that keep an eye on their cash flow. Cash flow is like blood. I don't care what kind of muscles you have. I don't care what kind of health that you pay attention to. If your blood stops flowing, you die. And your cash flow is the lifeblood of your business. Make sure you focus on it. Pay yourself first and don't lock your money away in places that it's really hard to access until you've got plenty of money in savings. Most people underemphasize liquidity, underemphasize having money in savings because it's not earning anything. I don't care whether it's earning something or not, that's your staying power when you have an illness, when you have family that you need to pay attention to, that starts to derail you from your business. All these businesses that go bankrupt, I would say 90% of the time could have been averted with good cash flow management. Now, some of them are pretty unlucky, like you. Remember, the, I remember hearing about the Concorde? This was an airplane that could like fly to London in a couple of hours. Yeah, they, they had some problems because one crashed. So, you know the day they decided to relaunch? September 11th, so that was really tough. I mean, that's just bad timing, right? That kind of stuff happens in business. Be willing to take your licks, be willing to not take that so personal and feel like a failure, learn from it, get up, and go do something afterwards. I think I'm out of time, right? So, can I end it with a two-minute story? Two-minute story? Yeah, two more minutes? Yeah. This is our class that's coming in here? Yeah. Okay, so, final story. So, my grandfather was the only one that was slightly entrepreneurial in my family. He had a TV repair shop, and he also had a plate accordion, and they, put, they toured on the weekends, and when he wasn't doing coal mining, he was playing the accordion in a band. And I love that, because when I was a kid, I would ride around with him in his little red van, and he would go and fix these Zenith TVs that were like more like a piece of furniture than a TV. But you know what? He was scared to just take the full leap. When I took the full leap, because Dean Templin encouraged me to do it, there's been nothing in my financial life that's paid off more, in my level of satisfaction, in you know, my choice to get up every day and do something that I really enjoy. And if I would have taken the job offers somewhere else instead of being an entrepreneur, Entrepreneurship isn't necessarily for everyone because it does take a certain amount of resilience, but if you're willing to do it, that's what's gonna make a huge difference and impact on the world today. So all the bad news that we hear about, the media doesn't pay much attention to entrepreneurs, yet most of the good that happens in the world comes from them. So don't let the bad news ever derail or keep you away. And if you don't have family to encourage you, just know there's people here that encouraged me and I'm here to encourage you because it made a huge difference. Even in 2008 when we did have a struggle for several months and where you know, we, we were basically scraping by, that kind of stuff happens. But then there's those days where you're just like, you have someone that you've really made an impact on their life. You've invented something that you feel like might change the, the face of, of the world to some small degree. That's pretty damn rewarding. So um, have a good one. Thanks for letting me share with you. Just a couple of quick questions. Maybe two. Yeah. When you say uh, pay yourself, um, kind of do something with a paycheck, you just take a small percentage and put it in the separate Put it in the separate account, and that money is to be used to pay off loans or to invest or to make sure you have at least six months' savings built up to cover any. Un, you know, unforeseen uh, issues because all of you are in, in store for financial surprises in your life. Some are prepared and can handle it, some aren't. Make sure you're prepared. So pay yourself first is simply before you spend a single dollar, you've already put money into the separate account. If they all go into one account, it gets commingled, it gets siphoned up, Parkinson's law hits it. If you know it's in this other account, it's an elegant tracking system, you know that it's there, and you know that it has a purpose, which is to help build and grow your wealth. One more question. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, we had a lot of, you know, our speakers just talked about all the super motivating and super positive things. What was like the hardest, most like struggling point in your So in. How did you find that motivation? 2008 was pretty, uh, it was probably tough. Uh, there's two, two parts that were a real struggle. 
One is, and I remember Professor Jensen, the accounting professor, saying, yeah, the only ship that isn't meant to sell is a partnership, you know? And like, I was like, man, what a negative outlook. He's like, you gotta be really careful in partnerships. I got into a partnership that was disastrous and that echoed in my head from college over and over. Um, because the people that you spend time with in the relationships, I'm sure you've heard, like your top five inner circle will dictate a lot of your income. Well, the people you avoid is even more critical than the people you spend your time with. You know, so I got involved in a partnership that this person did something really good for me and seemed like he had high integrity for 10 years, but then he started to divert funds. We had a real estate partnership on a 45,000 square foot building and he started getting financial trouble and he started to take the money and put it into other things it wasn't supposed to go in, wasn't paying the taxes, and then you know, started lying to his investors. And so that really, that was really hurtful, harmful, that, that like derailed me for a full year to recover from that, learn the lessons from it, and to kind of get back on track because it was a real shot to my confidence. And the other thing is when I said I wanted to do Killing Sacred Cows as a New York Times bestseller, I had 100 real estate properties at that time, and some of my real estate partners declared bankruptcy, went out of business, and I wasn't really, real estate wasn't my thing. I was counting on their expertise. So I now had to take over and manage all those properties. At the same time, I'm trying to launch a book, which was a half a million dollar commitment. So now I'm spending a half a million dollars. At the same time, I'm hemorrhaging over here. So I'm doing book tours, doing radio shows, doing TV shows, and at the same time, trying to manage this portfolio. That was really hard to get through because before that, I had just gotten Inc. 500, we had had every single year from the time we started business going up, and that was the first year we had business go down. And so you get to kind of have a real test. But where I learned, the big lessons I learned is, most people just think that if they just avoid the situation, meaning they don't tell people what's happening, like that it will be okay. I actually just started being completely open. I called anyone that I was in business with, that worked for my firm, we had meetings, I said exactly what was going on, I told them what the plan was, and I said I'm gonna put my head down and run with this. If you need something from me, if you could be the proactive one and reach out to me, for me to manage this whole thing is gonna be a little bit chaotic. And everyone, was actually totally cool through it. Some people got paid late. Some people had, you know, situations where uh, they they it took me a long time to get there. But I'll tell you what, when I finally paid and made them whole on their interest, on their page, on everything, I had raving fans because most people during those times fell off. And that's why guys like Rich are huge advocates for me, is because you get to see, you know, when times are abundant, everyone has pretty decent integrity most of the time. When times are tight, you get to see people's real character and see how they're gonna show up. And those people that are willing to like actually tell you the truth and let you know that they're struggling or let you know what's happening beforehand rather than after the fact where you're chasing them down, you gain a real respect for and you got people that you could really trust as a solid foundation to move forward in a powerful way. And so 2008 was tough. Had more accolades that year, but I went around with no money in my pocket only borrowing my wife's credit card here and there to put gas in a vehicle. We like everything we had in our house, which was like crappy shampoo that was sitting in the basement. We're like, okay, we used everything. We just got super resourceful. And I mean, I actually borrowed money from my grandparents. I borrowed money from my mom uh, because I knew that the vision was there. I knew that we were on the right track. I just knew that I had made some pretty major mistakes out of simple greed, arrogance, lack of vetting, not listening to, to people around me. Like my wife, was freaking genius at saying who wasn't a good person. I'm like, what are you talking about? Now I'm like, hey, what do you think about this person? She's like, ah, I'm like, I don't even care if it is a good deal. We're moving forward without it because if you feel at all, because she has that intuition, you know? And I think sometimes we get to a point where I felt like I was Midas in 2007. My business grew so massively, everything was working so well. And then you just get, I was getting to a point where I was buying stupid things. I was hiring friends and overpaying them. I just wasn't using the principles of business simply because I thought I was, I was bigger than that, right? So it's kind of nice to have those situations where you learn massively, but the key is open up, be proactive, and don't give up because I think as long as you have a compelling vision, you can get through anything.